Hello SGD, let's have a look at ancient Egyptian technologies and the response to this recurring theme against like how did they do it. Um, now Temple of Hathor in Dendera, now there you can see where they've in, gone through the cleaning process and you still see part of the ceiling still very dirty from soot. Now for instance when the first you know Egyptologist explorers come along people were still living in these temples, you had families living in there they were making campfire, you know, their fires, cooking fires, the oil from this and just the soot from the um, smoke because dung was a common fuel as well, especially like in Egypt where their uh, timber's not uh, freely available and that would stain the roofs and so there you see how dirty it was and then the cleaning process. Uh, here's another example on the wall, so now they're using lasers to clean it um, to try and preserve the colours rather than, you know, just like water and a brush, which would be uh, damaging. But that sort of brings up the question, so how did the ancient Egyptians see in the dark in these underground tombs to, to do their painting, to apply the plaster and so on? Now when you look at places such as this, these temples, these were open, and you know, again people have been living there, they put their animals inside there, that type of stuff. Uh, but when tombs such as this are uncovered, there's no soot on the roofs. So how, what was their light source? How did they do this without st staining the walls and the roofs? Uh, how did they carve out features such as a descending passage in the Great Pyramid? Or in a common one that's brought up in regards to the Serapim, you don't have natural lighting, so how did they do their work? So it seems that the boxes were only partially um, completed before they were brought in and that uh, uh, and finished on site. At least that would appear to be so. But how did they do this without natural light? There should be soot all over the place, all over the ceiling especially. One of the standard uh, answers and people like because of Hollywood, you see scenes like this where you know you just I think it was even in the uh, Indiana Jones movie, just sort of just give a flick of the of the mirror. And all of a sudden, everything's lit up and beautiful and highly illuminated. Well, in reality, that doesn't work. So experiments using modern mirrors, much height, not just polished copper, using very good modern mirrors, even an open hall where they have a really strong light source and they reflect it. After a few reflections, it's pretty much useless. Um, now, in an open hall where you've got a really strong light source to begin with, uh, it barely works, but it's not so bad. You could get away with it. However, that you know doesn't quite work when you think about places such as the Serapeum because first because of the angle of the entrance, but then you have to bounce the light around all these corners. It just doesn't cut it, especially without uh, even with modern mirrors, it's not going to really work. Uh, let alone with just a highly polished um, uh, copper or some sort of metal such as that. So it just doesn't work. And on top of that, the sun's constantly moving. So unlike the Hollywood one where it, you know, they can just wander around and stay there, after a minute or two, the sun's moved its position uh, and the mirrors are just not going to be reflecting. So, yeah, you know, if you were to do that, which you're really not, uh, you, you would have to, you know, have super mechanisms or just, you know, really skillful people keeping on angling it. So it just doesn't cut it in places such as these underground tombs, such as Valley of the Kings or here at the Serapium in Saqqara. So one of the go-to things is um, uh, the Dendera light bulb, as it's called. Now this was again comes quite late. This is not a modern. I mean, this is not very, very ancient. This is still ancient Egypt, but it's in the much later period that this was made as well. And so, uh, but it's just an example of projecting modern solutions onto ancient stuff. Now, in uh, there in Dendera as well, we have this image. Now there's uh, a little reference to Natron here, I'll come back to that in regards to the plaster, but just in terms of projection, you know, okay, it's, I see a land speeder from Star Wars, so I see Thunderbird 2, even dropping the pod, uh, there's an attack helicopter, there's a super tank, and why not, let's have like in Singapore, you have that hotel with a giant pool on the top, so these are examples of projecting modern solutions onto ancient ones, but let's look at the uh, the known materials and ancient references. So how did they see in the dark? How did they put this stuff on without 
staining the roof. Now, uh, get from you know up until you know the true modern times and modern technology, people using uh, these were oil lamps, but even miners used to use candles, and you can get away with it. So you know, working in dark dark places, you know, candlelight does work. However, these types, especially paraffin and these types of candles, are, are going to leave soot. So uh, the light works, but not not the the lack of staining. Now, ancient lamps across the ancient world were very similar to this. You would put oil in, you would attach it. So that's a modern you know recreation of one. You put the oil in, you, just like a candle, you put in your wick, and again, you get a good light. Now, people have been it's not excellent, but it works. Now, if you also think, you know, like uh, you know, the sort of Downton Abbey type of period when people were walking around with uh, candlesticks, uh, you'd often see them with a little mirror. Even kerosene lamps will have a little mirror there so where you can boost up the light. Very much similar to lighthouses. The light globe, you know, uses mirrors to enhance and direct the light. And so even just with an ancient type of mirror, like a polished copper one, you can, even with a very small flame, you do get a reasonable amount of light, and then you can use uh, something like this to enhance the light. However, this still leaves you with a problem of the soot, uh, especially you know oil. Uh, it's going to leave a soot's going to build up and stain the ceilings and the walls. So there is a answer to this, and that would firstly go back to Egyptian faience and or glass making. Now, crushed quartz, they would use. Um, even in Mesopotamia, very secret, secretive process it was actually making these uh, ancient glass. But one of the essential ingredients in there was natron, a uh, type of salt. And uh, dry lake beds was a, you know, for instance, the Great Bitter Lake, which is now part of the Suez Canal. Before the Suez Canal was there, it was a, essentially a dry lake bed. And so that would have been one source, but there are others... Um, in Egypt and uh, across that part of the world. But natron was a very important ingredient in that glass making. And in terms of lighting, castor oil would be the next one. But we'll come to that in a moment because... Uh, now, for instance, up until the Western Roman Empire, glass was being made in Britain. They would import natron from Egypt and that part of the world and they would use that to make their glass. When the Western Roman Empire collapsed, the natron trade collapsed and so no new glass was being made so whether it was bottles or uh, windows broken glass was very valuable because it could be recycled so for centuries there in in britain but probably in other parts of uh, western europe as well without the natron glass making essentially dried up for centuries it was all being recycled i'll put the link into this video it's a cool little video ancient technology Saxon glass working experiment by the Lindy Beige channel. Natron uh, was an essential element um, mineral used in mummification because it's a salt, it's a, it absorbs water. When they opened up the body in the cavity, they would put in bags of natron, almost like a sponge, and it would soak up the water. But it's also mentioned in the pyramid, all the pyramid texts, but the pyramid texts of Unus, uh, oldest religious text in the world, just references, you know, natron. Uh, over and over again, very, very important. So there's a bag of natron from inside of uh, Tutankhamun. Uh, natron, the Natron Lake in Tanzania. So here you see an example of what happens with you know natron. It, the, it, the salt it just sucks the moisture out of uh, the animals and leaves you with mummified creatures. Uh, Natron was also an essential ingredient along with copper in making this very expensive colour back in the day, uh, Egyptian blue. So you can see, so yeah, so a bit like sacra blue or sacred blue. It's always been a pretty expensive, very expensive colour. Back in the day, colours were dyes, pigments such as blue, purple were super expensive. That's why uh, regal purple is a connected with royalty because it was so expensive that just to have a stripe of a purple dye on your toga meant you were really really rich so blue purple um, very expensive colors and that's same with the tombs how they were painted with this Egyptian blue connection with natron there but also the plaster 
So, for instance, in tombs such as this, they would plaster it over, almost like a fresco. They would paint onto this plaster. And it's still a bit of a mystery exactly how they made these, because these plasters last a really long time. It's not like plaster of Paris. It's a, yeah, it was a, some sort of um, quite a skill in there. You know, so you see where these plaster's fallen off. Uh, some other examples would be, you know, again, people would see this and uh, standard, you know, you would look at it and you'd think it's actually carved into stone. Uh, very often stuff like this was actually plastered and then when the, the mud is still soft, you can stamp it and carve it in. So these are not actually, a lot of the stone carvings are not stone carvings, it's just plaster. And that's why there's a lot of confusion in regards to, uh, you know, this attack chopters and, and what happens was that they would plaster over um, older hieroglyphs, do repairs and that creates these layering effect and then some of that plaster falls off from the previous one and that's one of the explanations for, yeah, so uh, a lot of this stone carving is not stone, it's plaster. Stretching the cord ceremony, Sheset, a very, very ancient ceremony. This is from the Ptolemaic era, but goes back uh, very, uh, way, way back to the um, early dina earliest dynastic period. And the use of natron as well for consecrating sacred buildings. Using salt to consecrate sacred buildings is still a thing uh, in traditions in uh, especially Eastern Orthodox uh, churches and so forth um, up until now. And also they would use a miniature um, presented as a small shrine, so just using a miniature, consecrating it, cleansing it in natron or salt. But we come back to natron, uh, historic, historical natron harvested salt mixture from dry lake beds, been used for thousands of years as a clean, cleaning product, this is in ancient Egypt, for both hot, um, home and body, blended with oil, it was an early form of soap, it softens water, removing oil and grease. Undiluted natron was a cleanser for the teeth and an early mouthwash. The mineral was mixed into early antiseptics for wounds and cuts. So it was also a medicine in that sense. Natron can be natron can be used to dry and preserve fish and meat. So again, like mummification of the bodies. It is also an ancient household insecticide and was used for making leather as well as bleach for clothing. So again, across all uh, trades and and applications at home. Uh, it also mentions. Uh, now I'm just using the wiki, but you can find other references to this as well. Natron is an ingredient for making Egyptian blue. It was used as a flux in Egyptian faience. So in the glassware that they made, if you wanted to attach a handle, the flux was, uh, you, you would paint the flux on, heat it up, and then it would help it weld together. And so Romans were also using natron as a flux to solder precious metals together. So whether it's gold or copper or silver, again, if you want to attach a handle. Um, if you're not familiar with soldering, but when people solder, they'll always use a flux, this uh, material. But here's the kicker, because castor oil comes in there now. Uh, Breaking Bad, there was that poisoned cigarette that went um, kept coming back in the, around in the show. Well, the poison was ricin, which is it's actually a... a a chemical weapon, very toxic, but ricin comes from the castor bean, and ricinus is the plant name, so ricin. Now it's mentioned in the Ebers papyrus, because castor oil was used as a medicine for all sorts of applications, uh, what's the term, so even to encourage uh, labour in pregnant women, but for many other um, forms. Castor beans have been found in ancient Egyptian tombs dating back to 4000 BC. Alright, so castor oil plus natron. Herodotus speaks of Egyptians using castor oil and natron in their lamps to make a smokeless flame. So even like a small handheld lamp such as this, mix your castor oil and your natron and you have a smokeless flame. And that would, uh, which allows Egyptian artisans to paint artworks inside ancient tombs without staining the walls and ceilings with soot. Now, the brazier, so we might have seen these big bowls, you know, in the fantasy movies like the Lord of um, Game of Thrones, for instance. You have, so it's not just these little handheld lamps. Uh, the Egyptians were using braziers as well, so you could light up larger areas and just use that same mix. So, how was these things done? Well, within the archaeological record.